Welcome to another episode of Outlier Academy, a show about the misfits, rebels, and idealists reshaping the way we work, live, and play, all told through in-depth conversations with incredible entrepreneurs and investors. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, I'm thrilled to share my conversation with Vivek Sedera, co-founder of Superhuman, the fastest email client in the world. Earlier this year, Superhuman raised their Series C, which valued the company at $825 million. Their mission is to help the world's busiest people, including doctors, lawyers, and executives, get time back by spending less time checking and answering email. In this conversation, we explore the lessons Vivek has learned as a repeat co-founder, why he made it clear he didn't want to be the CEO of Superhuman from day one, and what it's like to be a non-CEO co-founder. What it's like to stand up new teams within Superhuman as they were scaling insanely quickly, including recruiting, customer delight, and finance. And how Vivek spots incredible talent, both at Superhuman and as an active angel investor. To learn more about Superhuman and become a customer, visit their website at superhuman.com. You can also find the show notes and transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 46. And if you haven't already, find us on Twitter at Outlier Academy and subscribe to our channel on YouTube at youtube.com slash Outlier Academy for more great quotes, ideas, and interviews from guests like Vivek. Now, let's jump in with Vivek. Vivek, welcome to Outlier Academy. I have been looking forward to this interview for a long time, and I really appreciate the time. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. So just to start, we're going to chat about a lot of things that I'm really excited about today. I think your journey founding, co-founding multiple companies, all around what that role entails being a co-founder at a company. So to start, I thought it would be helpful. We're going to spend most of our time kind of focused on your experience at Superhuman. So can you paint just a quick sketch of your background kind of before Superhuman, leading up to that? Sure. My career started as an undergrad at UC Berkeley. I was a chemical and nuclear engineering major was going down that path. And it was my senior year of college where I accidentally took an entrepreneurship class. <laughs> Long story short, a friend meant to email a different Vivek, accidentally emailed me about this class. I was like, what is this? Took the class, caught the bug, and took a few more classes. And then I completely course corrected my career in my life. And I started taking entrepreneurship classes came out of college, decided not to do a PhD in nuclear engineering and instead go into startups. And so I'm going to date myself here as 2006. And I got connected to this founder by the name of Orrin Hoffman, who had previously started up and sold multiple companies. And so for me, I was just very eager to learn at the feet of a master and just learn what it takes to build a company. And so that first company was called Rapleaf. We went through various pivots. It started out as a peer-to-peer reputation platform that turned into a marketing intelligence company that then pivoted to become an ad tech company and rebranded as LiveRamp. And that is now a publicly traded company. I think it's worth $4 billion valuation market cap on the New York Stock Exchange. So that was my first foray into tech. And I really cut my teeth there. And I joined that company as his co-founder. It's kind of a business co-founder at Jack of All Trades. And so after that, I had a lot of people tell me, you know, Vivek, you'd make a great CEO. You should go start a company. You have a lot of really cool, interesting ideas. And so I was like, you know, that's not a bad idea. I think I shall do that. And so I took some time off, explored some ideas, started a second company that I named Airseed. And it was a developer platform around consumer intelligence and analytics. Didn't get to product market fit with that company. And I learned that the hard way. With my first company, with Rapleaf that turned into LiveRamp, it went through various pivots and we stumbled into product market fit. And so with the second company, I wasn't intentional around finding product market fit, assuming it was going to happen. And that was a huge mistake and a huge lesson learned there. But it was too late at that point. I was pretty burned out. I had burned through pretty much all of our investors' seed capital. I burned through a lot of my savings. And I realized a few things. Building a developer platform is really hard. Don't grow the business until you hit product market fit. And the third, I think, was incredibly salient for me. It was you're not actually meant to be a CEO. That's not your place in the world. And so made the decision to shut down that company. And literally the next day, got reconnected with Rahul Vora, 
who is our co-founder CEO here at Superhuman. He's someone I had known for many years, and that was the history prior to Superhuman itself. That is fascinating. I, I don't typically ask follow-up questions, but I think I have to ask a couple. The first is, what serendipity to be emailed instead of this other Vivek and have that pique your interest on kind of studying entrepreneurship? It seems like very out of left field compared to what you were studying. So I'm curious what piqued your interest and made you like decide that this was the direction you were going to start heading in? It was a few things. One, there was a ceiling in terms of one's progress if you go down academia or if you want to be a PhD or you want to... I was doing research on generation four nuclear reactors, fusion technology in particular. And so there was a ceiling there long, long feedback loops and cycles. Like you're waiting five to 10 years before you actually see any fruits of your labor. And for me, I'm more of like an instant gratification kind of person. I've also, ever since I could remember, I've had this, I don't know, this like entrepreneurial business acumen, you know, like the lemonade stands, kind of coming up with these like business ideas growing up. And I was never able to fully explore those. And it wasn't until I took this class and this first class was an entrepreneurship lecture series. So I just sat in the audience and I'm listening to these entrepreneurs, these founders who have been successful come in. And I've been fortunate enough to actually come back to that same exact class. It's like auditorium of a couple hundred people and speak about my experience to kind of close the loop there. But for me, it was really just an eye opening, like, wow, okay, this is an alternate path than what I had been going down through high school, through college, that I can actually have much more of an impact on the world than what I'm currently doing through my academic endeavors. That makes sense. And on the second point would be particularly that kind of moment in time in your story where you go, you decide, yes, I'm going to try my hand at being the CEO. You kind of come out of that and in your words, you maybe come to terms with the fact or just get comfortable with the fact that like, that's not your role. That's not where that's meant to be. I imagine that was probably extremely painful. And at some point in time, you got over that and could relate to that more positively. I just would love to hear you talk a little bit about that, because I think that we all need to learn what we're good at. A part of that is accepting certain things that we're just not cut out for. And I feel like you can either bang your head against that wall endlessly or you can kind of evolve and move on. Yeah. So the failure of my second company and having to shut that down was the most painful professional experience I've ever had, but it was the greatest teacher. It taught me so many lessons and it allowed me to tap into my self-awareness. And so when we didn't hit product market fit, it was something I realized towards the end of the company a couple months from actually shutting it down where I was like, oh, we should actually be taking more of an intentional approach here. I made huge mistakes in trying to build out this company, the second company, Airseed. And I spent weeks, if not months, laying in bed depressed once I had this like realization that this is going to end not well and it's going to end poorly. And the disappointment with my team, the disappointment from my investors, the disappointment from my friends and family, and just having to face that. And I, I really had to look at myself. And I do distinctly remember this one particular moment where I was looking at myself in the mirror, in my bathroom. And I don't exaggerate when I say this, like I had tears in my eyes and I'm like, I'm a complete failure. How did this happen? And I really just had to look inwards and realize, you know what, maybe you're not meant to be a CEO. What is your place in this world? And so I had all these questions going through my head. And I truly believe that each one of us on this planet has this particular place in the world, and they fit within a particular construct around this world and around society. And so for me, I was like, I achieved some success with my first company, I didn't achieve success with the second company where I'm CEO. So I had very limited data points, but I'm like, you know, I actually don't care about control. I care about influence. And I, I've studied so many founders and so many CEOs, folks I know personally, folks I've studied from afar that I admire, and others who have been unsuccessful and have failed. And I found that the best CEOs, without sounding too harsh here, are like a bit of like control freaks, like they exercise control. 
And that's actually something I look for when I'm investing in other founders and other companies. I look for a CEO who has a penchant for that. I didn't really care about control. I cared about influence. So in the context of Superhuman, when we were starting the company, this was a conversation that came up between Rahul and I, where he's like, I'm going to be the CEO of the company. And I was like, I want you to be the CEO. I never want to be CEO ever again. And I explained why. And one of the things I said to him was like, look, I don't care if you push the button. As long as I get to bend your ear and say, hey, I recommend you push the button. That's what matters to me the most. And so I didn't value control. I valued influence. I wasn't technical, especially if you're building a software company. I found the best CEOs are ones who have a technical and product background, whereas I had more of a business background. And I would say those are some of the major elements. And in all honesty, being a CEO is so incredibly stressful. It's so incredibly stressful. It's lonely. It was a very lonely experience being the founder CEO of my company, even though I did have co-founders where I didn't really have a support structure. I know that there are a lot of resources now in the market for founders and founder CEOs in particular with providing support and coaching and whatnot, but I didn't really have that. And so it was just something where I'm like, I prefer being the number two. I don't want to be the number one. And I'm happier that way because I'm trying to optimize for happiness. I'm not trying to optimize for ego. That's a great quote. I think we're (laughs) going to take that out, put that in the show notes of this one. I'd love to explore transition a little bit and kind of dive deeper into Superhuman. And to start, I imagine almost everyone on this podcast has heard of Superhuman. (laughs) The vast majority, a vast percentage are going to be Superhuman users. But for those that aren't familiar, can you maybe just kind of give us the quick sales pitch, kind of get people from zero to one on what Superhuman is? Yeah. Superhuman is, we're building the fastest email experience in the world. There are a billion professionals that spend at least three or four hours a day in their inbox, not just folks in tech, but we're talking like teachers and doctors and architects, you name it. Lawyers. Exactly. And we give them time back. We give them mastery at their fingertips. Superhuman is rooted in speed. We obsess about speed, everything from using the product to the user experience, to performance, to how you do email. And so we see that because of that, we're saving the average superhuman user about 30 minutes to an hour a day versus what they're doing before. Yeah. And I can attest to that. I think at this point, I've used it for three years. I've introduced it to a lot of other people and it's indispensable. I mean, as soon as you kind of like learn how to use it and are able to use the features, I mean, I'm kind of, I use it almost comically in that I've got six different inboxes (laughs) going in between and kind of triaging throughout the day. So I would highly recommend it for anyone that hasn't checked it out. I want to go back to that email you got from Aul, and that timing seems spooky in that you shut down that company and then you get this email. Maybe talk a little bit about what was in that email, what you were thinking in the moment, and then we can start to walk through a little bit of kind of the founding origin story of Superhuman. Yeah. So it actually wasn't an email. I went to an event and it was at Sonoma Speedway and it was an event for founders and investors. And so again, The night prior, I'd made the decision, okay, I think I need to shut this company down. I'd already pre-registered for this event. So I went to this event anyways, and Rahul pulls up. I I haven't seen Rahul in years. He and I had known each other professionally from his first company, Reportive, which my company at the time was helping to power some of the APIs for Reportive. And so we had built initially a professional relationship that then turned into a friendship. When he sold Reportive to LinkedIn, he was in a bit of a black hole at LinkedIn and I was in a bit of a black hole with my own company. So we lost touch for a couple of years, but I saw him at this event and we rekindled our friendship. And yeah, I remember giving him like a big bear hug and we were just hanging out and we didn't skip a beat. And so it was the next day where we decided, you know, we should grab drinks. We should hang out more properly. And drinks led to us hanging out over the next two weeks. And we were pretty much spending every evening or every other evening just catching up on life, talking about relationships. But then we also started talking about our own prior professional experiences and what happened with LinkedIn, what happened with Reported, what happened with my company, et cetera. And yeah, and then he just started pitching me this idea for Superhuman. And so if you don't mind, I love telling the story. Yeah, please do. Yeah, I remember asking him, so what are you thinking now? You've taken about a year off. You've kind of had time to recharge and think about the next thing. And he's like, you know, I'm thinking about rebuilding email. And I was like, that's kind of insane. So you want to go up against Google and Microsoft? And it's like, yeah, I'm like, okay, I'd love to hear more. And so I remember asking him, 
do you have a name for a company picked out? And he's like, yeah, superhuman. So I was drinking a scotch at the time. And I remember almost spitting out my drink, like doing a spit take and just like, wait, what? And he's like, superhuman. I'm like, you're kidding, right? And he's like, no. I'm like, incredibly intrigued. And so I was like, okay, I definitely have to hear more. He pitched me on this idea. He pulled out his laptop. He was showing me all this research he had done. He was showing me like this billion plus professionals and all these studies and all this data around email consumption and usage and how much time folks were spending there. He then started showing me these high level wireframes for what he was thinking about. And so I was incredibly intrigued. I, I think like most folks, wasn't thinking about fixing email, but I was, my heart is drawn towards the productivity space. And superhuman wasn't just something that was going to rebuild email. It was meant to be much bigger in the scope of productivity. And so what Rahul said to me during one of our conversations fundamentally shifted my thinking. He was like, you know, Vivek, it's unlikely that folks like you and I are going to find solutions to famine or war. It's unlikely that Vivek and Rahul are going to find a cure for cancer or AIDS or take mankind to Mars. But what we can do is create tools for people that are. Tools for that cancer researcher, that high school teacher, whoever it is, the next Elon Musk, help them move 10x faster, be 10x more productive, be 10x more brilliant. That is our contribution to society. That's how we're going to level up mankind is by augmenting people's natural capabilities with the software and tools that we create, give them superpowers and make them superhuman. And that's where the name of the company came from. He was so serious about the brand and about the mission. I, he had already spent over six figures getting the domain superhuman.com. And I was like, wow, okay, you absolutely are serious about this. And so over the following few weeks after that, we started courting each other. We hadn't worked with each other side by side professionally, even though we were more business development partners with our prior company. So he was like, you know, I'd love to talk to some professional references. And I was like, I'd love to talk to some of your professional references. <laughs> and so I gave him, I think like 15 or 20 references. He gave me a similar amount. I talked to all of these folks. He talked to my references and came back. And at the time, he wasn't looking to bring on a non-technical co-founder. In his mind, he was thinking it was going to be him and our current CTO, Conrad. And so once he and I started going down this rabbit hole of talking about superhuman, I think his eyes started to really open up and he started to realize that, okay, there's a lot that goes with company building. That's not just writing code and producing product. And that's where I came in and I was like, look, this is absolutely where I can lend my expertise and exercise my zone of genius here as we go from zero to one. And I want to talk about some of those functions within the company that you've taken from zero to one. And, you know, something that I brought up when we were chatting, kind of preparing for this is, and we'll link to it in the show notes, and I encourage anyone listening to follow you, Vivex on Twitter at V Sodera, S-O-D-E-R-A, the Twitter handle. And he put out a thread on August 11th, which I thought was really profound because it was basically one kind of just being super open with the fact that he's a co-founder, but he's not a CEO and he's not a CTO. And that's something I think is not talked about enough is anyone that invests in companies, see a lot of companies with multiple, multiple co-founders. And I don't feel like you've heard many of those stories come out, but then you listed the functions in the company you've taken from zero to one, including finance, recruiting, customer delight. I know you recently just did some security work on an incredibly fun <laughs> new security project. So talk about, I guess, starting at the highest level, how does that relationship work? Do you and Rahul map out what the next priority is, and then what does it look like for you to jump in and really take something from zero to one? I think it would have been incredibly challenging to operate with confidence if I didn't have done my first and also my second company. The first company gave me a lens, Rapley Fly Ramp, gave me a lens in terms of what it takes to take a company from zero to one, zero to two, et cetera. The second company allowed me to be empathetic and be more of like a CEO whisperer, consigliere to the CEO through my experience and my failure there, and really just empathize with that particular role. So the way that that went down, we officially started the company May 11th, 2015. And that week we were working out of a co-working space called Galvanize only for a week until we found a work-live loft that we eventually settled into. 
And so that week, we started writing code. This was being done by Conrad, as well as Rahul. Rahul was doing a lot of the design work as well. And then I started to take care of a lot of the other elements pre-product market fit. And these elements included like helping with some of the incorporation aspects to we were starting to hire like one or two engineers. I took on the recruiting. I've been fortunate to have years of recruiting experience, have interviewed 3,000 plus engineers in my career, had the playbooks in mind. And so the biggest challenges that startups encounter for the most part The three I would say are finding product market fit, finding the right people, and then fundraising. We had a strong product and technical team with Rahul and Conrad and our first engineer, Pavesh. And Rahul is just a master fundraiser. But the hiring piece was something that they didn't have as a toolkit, as part of the toolkit. And so I took that on initially and I wore a lot of different hats. It wasn't a I was just focused on recruiting. It was, okay, I'm going to do recruiting, plus I'm going to take care of all of these operational aspects with the company, like setting up payroll, for example, setting up HR, setting up all of that. And yeah, so from a recruiting standpoint, scale the team to about 25 people or so until we brought on our now head of people, Kristen Hayward. And her claim to fame was she scaled Zenefits, she scaled Flexport. But prior to that, I was the one who was doing the sourcing, the interviewing, the final interviews, et cetera. And so I think it's important to let folks who have a zone of genius operate in that zone. And for Conrad, it's writing code. For Rahul, it's product design marketing. And so for me, I took everything off of their plate as much as possible to kind of let them focus there. And so once we started onboarding customers, we had to have some type of feedback loop and some channel with customers. And in the very beginning, it was Rahul, Conrad, and our current head of strategy and analytics, Gaurav, where he served as a generalist at Swiss Army Knife as well. And it was them answering like five or 10 emails a day. But once we really started onboarding customers, I remember looking at and mind you, I'm still like managing a lot of our recruiting functions. I remember looking at how Rahul was keeping track of customer issues and he had a Google Sheet. I think it was a Google Sheet or an Excel spreadsheet. And I was like, wow, this is jank. Like, this is not going to scale. And I was like, how do you know how many people are requesting calendaring, for example? And he would do a control F search. I'm like, well, let me type scheduling. Okay, so you miss those people who mentioned scheduling, which is kind of in the same vein of calendaring. And so that's where I then built out our CRM, so to speak, an Airtable, set up Zapier connections, et cetera. And then I retroactively, I remember I spent an entire week and I pulled some all-nighters to retroactively tag about 10,000 pieces of customer feedback to issues and feature requests and whatnot. We surprisingly still use this instance. I was hoping we'd wean off of it by now, but... Yeah, we have, I don't know, however many tens of thousands of customers and I don't know, however many pieces of feedback, but it's still going strong. And so while I was running a lot of our recruiting functions, I was answering customer emails. And I think at one point it scaled to about 100 emails a day. So I'm like, just like trying to go super fast. And we had a goal of getting back to customers within five minutes. So it's like, we would get an email and I would try to respond in five minutes. And so it's constant context switching, which is incredibly painful for someone who has ADHD. And so I'd been diagnosed with ADHD. This was actually during the period of just depression, a few months of depression was shutting down my company. And I saw a psychiatrist about this and they're like, you've been diagnosed with ADHD. Here's some meds if you'd like to take some. And so it's incredibly painful to do this constant context switching, but it's what the company needed. And then we eventually brought on our first customer delight specialist. And then I started to hand the reins over to that person And now we have an entire organization, entire team around what we call customer delight. Other organizations call customer support. And now it's, we're managing our finances. I'm driving a lot of that until we bring on a director of finance. I had to take care of superhuman SOC 2 compliance, which we're still in the middle of. Yeah. It feels like you jump into areas, try your best, (laughs) even when it's not the perfect setup, get the work done, which is incredibly important. And I think for anyone that hasn't 
been in the operating seat at a quickly scaling company, there's just a mind boggling amount of very manual work where there's no leverage to be found. All you can throw at it is brute force it with hours. Absolutely. Yeah. And I do want to touch upon that for a bit. Yeah, please. Doing a startup, I think there's a romanticized notion of starting a company and being a founder. And it is a lot of work. It's less inspiration and more perspiration. It requires a certain work ethic. Being the non-CEO, non-CTO co-founder is oftentimes a thankless job. And even if I wasn't a co-founder and just I was an early stage employer or later stage employee, just exercising this fiduciary duty and looking out in the best interest of the company over your own needs. And so I'm constantly in service of the company and put aside my own wants and needs in order to like help the company scale. I'd love to yeah, kind of continue that line of thought, bubble up the conversation a little bit to go a little bit higher level and kind of ask the question and maybe reframing it a little bit. Like if you were sitting down with someone that was like, I really like the path that you've gone on. <laughs> I'm a, I am want to be a co-founder. I don't think I'm the CEO or the CTO. What advice would you give them in terms of how to kind of set their expectations correctly, but also how to just set them up for success? All right. So I'm going to rapid fire, make some recommendations. One, get a therapist, get a coach. (laughs) A therapist helps you deal with your past issues. A coach helps you work towards the future. And so when you're starting a company, you're a founder, the company is an extension of you. And so if you have baggage and issues that you haven't dealt with, it's going to come up and it's going to manifest in dysfunctional ways in your company. And so for me, for example, I had someone who was an NLP coach who actually employed some therapist-esque techniques. And he was like, you know, Vivek, it seems like you're kind of doing this company to prove to your dad that you can do this. And it was within the first session, within 20 minutes of talking to this person. And I was just like, you're totally right. I shouldn't be doing this to prove to my dad my worth. I should be doing this for myself. And it really just kind of like lifted this weight off my shoulders. And so I highly recommend getting a therapist, getting a coach. Also, by the way, working with a therapist helps you kind of better understand your own emotions, your feelings, and how to communicate. And so I take a lot of my learnings through therapy, and I apply it in my professional relationships. So that's been a huge, huge value add. Start to identify advisors and mentors. I've done this more from a piecemeal, non-intentional point of view. But I think if I could have done it over again, I would have been very intentional and just like surrounded myself and have a periodic cadence of kind of having these folks provide level of mentorship and advice. Learn to write code. If I could go back, I would push myself to be more technical. When I started my second company, I did a four-day sprint. This is back when Ruby was all the rage. I taught myself Ruby, enough Ruby to write a LinkedIn scraper using a Selenium gem and scrape LinkedIn data. And I was doing this for the purpose of like trying to build out my founding team. But as a result of that exercise, I was able to actually have some technical conversations with potential co-founders that I would like to bring on board. And so not just that, but by having a technical background, you can spin up prototypes, you can spin up products. You don't even actually need to be super technical nowadays with all these like low code, no code solutions in the market. But I think it definitely makes you that much more valuable if you have the ability to write JavaScript or write some code. You talked about something that was pretty interesting because I've had a similar experience of even if you spend a little bit of time leading a company, founding a company, and then ultimately decide that you just don't feel like you enjoy that position, kind of leading a company. But there's something that it gives, which is a tremendous amount of empathy, that if you're going to be a co-founder to a CEO or work closely with the CEO is enormously helpful. And it feels like even your advice there of learning to code is like partly just so you can speak in that and so you're more fluent in it. But I'm guessing part of it too is maybe empathy. But talk a little bit about just your experience being able to relate as a co-founder to a CEO and what they're going through. And if there's any advice there, kind of any general advice to share. Yeah. The CEO role is the absolute hardest role. It is one that should be appropriately compensated. So whenever I see there's a founding team and let's say there's two founders and they each give themselves a 50-50 split from an equity standpoint, I'll actually advise them, no, actually you should be 55-45. 
the CEO incurs the most risk and compensation like equity, I have a definition. Equity is a form of compensation that's a function of risk. And the CEO incurs the absolute most risk. They're the face of the company. They take the heat. At the end of the day, everything's their fault. That's the job. Yep. Right? Like if there's a problem with a particular part of the organization, it's because the CEO didn't set up the leader of that organization. It might be a VP. It might be a manager. It might be a head of. Didn't set up that person for success. You can do a root cause analysis and every <laughs> problem in the company is the CEO's problem. It's the CEO's fault. They did something not right. Maybe they didn't make the right hire. They didn't set this person up for success. They didn't provide the right North Star, set the appropriate expectations, et cetera, et cetera. And so as a result, the CEO takes on so much burden, so much stress. I've actually seen my CEO friends within a matter of two or three years go from a full, like whatever their hair color is to like all of a sudden they have a lot of gray hairs. It's that stressful. And so at the same time, it's also incredibly lonely, as I had mentioned earlier. And so in my conversations with Rahul, especially during the early days, I would poke and I would prod and I would try to get a sense of how he's feeling. Because I understood from my prior experience how lonely it was, and I would get him to open up about it. And I would be a support structure for him and let him know like, hey, look, this is going to get better. Like, I'm here to support you. Like, you tell me what you need. I'm happy to help out here. And I remember even in the early days, this was a, probably, I want to say three years ago, where I had pushed Rahul to work with an executive coach. And it wasn't a top priority for him because he was kind of thinking about all the different fires that he was dealing with the company. But I realized that the potential of the company was really limited by Rahul's potential. And so I needed to push him to be better and to level up. And as a result, the company would have a higher ceiling and would be inevitably leveled up as well. And so I did a lot of the legwork and finding various coaches, different styles. And I interviewed them. I took notes and I like handed it to him on a silver platter. I'm like, here you go. Pick which coach you want to work with. And he eventually worked with, I think, two of the three coaches over the following couple of years. So having that, look, I can empathize to like a degree of what you're going through. I obviously can't empathize. Like right now, Superhuman is a hundred plus person company. I cannot fathom the level of stress and the things that Rahul has to deal with at the scale that we're at. We had just raised a Series C from IVP, companies valued at X amount. We have a lot more eyes on us now. And so there's a lot more pressure to keep this thing growing and scaling. And that then turns into a lot of kind of stress on someone like Rahul. And so, but during the early days, it was definitely like, hey, I kind of can get what you're going through. Let me try to help out here. And I would proactively try to take things off of his plate or proactively help him behind the scenes so that he can scale and, and therefore the company can scale as well. Yeah, I love your perspective. And I want to come back and talk about some of your comments there around coaching in just a second. But one question that I have to ask, and it's a super broad question and kind of by design, because I'm just interested to see where you take it. But superhuman for anyone that's familiar, I think people are just really impressed by. They're impressed at the execution. They're impressed at obviously how it's grown. I think they're impressed at the product experience. I think it just feels like it's kind of playing its own game and doing that really successfully. And I, I don't, you know, I don't think I'm making that up. I think that's something that's generally kind of the perspective of the people that I talk with. And so the question I would ask you is, what do you feel like is superhuman secret ingredient or its superpower that <laughs> allows it to kind of have been so successful so far and to just continue kind of exceeding expectations and growing at an unreal rate? Do you want to know the secret? Yeah. I don't know if I should share this. <laughs> the secret is it's the people. It really is. I think we have pound for pound the best team in the world. I sat in a couple YC demo days, not the last YC demo day, but the one or two before. And there were so many of these YC startups that are pitching themselves as we're the superhuman for X, we're the superhuman for Y. And it was flattering, but at the same time, weird. I'm like, we're not Uber scale. We're only, at the time, I think we we're only like 50 people. I'm like, this is crazy. This is insane. And that's a function of, how much we've invested in the brand, how much we've invested in the product, our customers, and just how folks perceive us. And that really 
comes down to having the right team in place. I think Rahul has the strongest founder market fit when it comes to building an email startup. This is something I also look for when I invest in other companies where I see, you know, is this what this person was meant to do in this world? And Rahul has this mantra where it's all about helping people be brilliant. And so with Reportive, he was helping people be brilliant with other people. With Superhuman, he's helping people be brilliant with email and their productivity. But he just bleeds this mission. And then here is someone who has some of the strongest product chops I've ever seen, who has this reality distortion effect, almost like Steve Jobs-esque, who can paint such a vivid story and vision. And that's rare to find. And it's also, he has a technical background. It's like superhuman would absolutely be a very different company today. And I don't think we'd be where we are if it were a different CEO. And then you have our CTO, Conrad, who is without a doubt the strongest engineer I've ever worked with. Like, you know, folks talk about the unicorn, the 10 extra, that's Conrad. These are highly influential key players, force multipliers in the company where we have Gorovs, our Swiss army knife. He can wear a lot of different hats. We have Amuye, who was actually probably the best hire I've ever made in my life. She's now our head of all engineering at Superhuman, but she came on as our first iOS lead. You know, Kristen, and we've kind of made recent hires. So at the end of the day, it's the people. There's actually really no secret sauce. It's the people. But I love that. Yeah. I love that because I think it makes sense even hearing you talk through that. I mean, it checks all the right boxes. And one thing I was thinking about as you were kind of listing those names and talking through that a little bit is I think it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on why the people are so important. Because I think obviously the kind of first order answer is, oh, you can just do more. The more talented people you have, the more you can do. But the thing I've noticed is that the best people also are, they are themselves as an individual, very ambitious, meaning they have very ambitious plans. And they also have very high expectations of what they're going to make and very high expectations of what they want to build. And it seems like those are as important, if not more important than just being able to do the work. Any thoughts, perspective there? Yeah. If you look at a sports team, like the Warriors, it's not just Steph Curry, it's Clay Thompson. It's these other folks who are on the team that come together and help take a team like the Warriors to becoming NBA champions. So yeah, it is the ambition. It's important to find folks who have core values alignment, because if you don't align on values, like their values, as well as the company's values, then you're going to have not the synchronicity and kind of like being able to move effectively forward, you're going to have friction and tension. We're not at that stage in society, maybe give us a few hundred years where you can assign non-people, i.e. AI and robots and whatnot to build companies. And maybe it might even happen much sooner than a couple hundred years. But at the end of the day, it is the people and you do have different perspectives, different life experiences. And this is why I think diversity is not just the right thing to do from like a hiring standpoint, investing in diversity, but it's just fundamentally good business to have people with diverse backgrounds. It really shows when you have this wider range from a perspective standpoint, from a problem solving standpoint, from finding a solution standpoint. So yeah, I would say those all play key parts and our components around why I think people are the primary driver. Yeah. On that diversity note, I think the way that I always kind of contextualize that and thought about that is the more diverse team that you've built, you're just increasing the sample size, meaning you're increasing the perspectives that people are going to bring to the problem or the solution or the discussion, which is really, really important. We've covered a ton of really interesting things. Like looking at my page here, there's so many questions I had written down that you naturally covered. So I think it would be great to maybe end on a couple of notes and touch on some things that we've talked about before. And one was This came up and it was a quote I wrote down when we were initially planning out what we discuss. And you just wrote down this notion and you gave me this quote that failure is a rite of passage, especially for entrepreneurs. And I would love it if you could just take it from there and expand on that idea for a little bit, because I think it's important. It relates to your story. And I think you'd have an interesting perspective. Yeah. Failure is life's greatest teacher. You learn so much about yourself, what you're capable of, what you're not capable of. 
in such a condensed amount of time through this experience of failure. It just like, it hits you like a truck. But once you wake up from the disorientation and then you can evaluate and you get over the initial emotional dysregulation or the emotional shock from the failure, you learn so much. And as long as you have a particular growth mindset, failure can absolutely be a great teacher. And so for me, I had mentioned this with my second company where it was a slow failure on my part. But once the realization hit me that, hey, we failed in this endeavor, it did hit me like a truck. And it was because I've always held this hope of like, maybe, maybe we'll figure out, maybe we'll get there, maybe we'll get there. And it's like, okay, at a certain point, it's like, I'm compromising my health, I'm compromising all these aspects of my life. And I actually have to be realistic here. I don't think we're going to get there. And so, yeah, it's something that I think, like, I wouldn't be where I'm at today with Superhuman if I didn't go through that failure, if I didn't develop that empathy for being a CEO, if I didn't develop that chip on my shoulder of finding product market fit. Because that played into Superhuman where we were talking about, okay, we need to figure out getting to product market fit. And I shared stories of my experience and how painful it was that I wasn't intentional about it. And I never wanted to experience that ever again. And I didn't want our team to experience that, what I had gone through. So yeah, it led me to where I'm at today. And I think you learn much more through your own failure and other people's failures in a much shorter time frame than I think you do through success. And it's a much looser and slower feedback loop when you have success. Like you have to retroactively look back and see, yeah, that was successful. For example, with Superhuman, we invested in this one-to-one onboarding approach. Distinctly remember that. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't immediately successful and we didn't realize like from day one, this was going to be a successful endeavor or approach, but it wasn't until we did a certain number of these that we then looked back analyze the data and we're like, oh, wow, we are successful in this approach. Whereas with failure, you get hit with all that information, and that data very quickly. And as long as I think you have the appropriate tools and you have the appropriate mindset to be able to consume all of that data and then piece it together and start to take some of the key learnings from that. It's kind of closest analogy or comparison is when Neo's in the matrix and he learns like karate for the first time. And he's just like, just jolted with all this information. He's like, I just learned karate. I just learned Kung Fu. And it's analogous to that. But with failure. <laughs> but with failure, right. It's just like, okay, I can't do this. I shouldn't do this. Da, 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 da. And then you're just like armed with all this. So I think the more you can fail, and obviously you should minimize instances of failure over time. But if you can fail early and often and learn from that, as quickly as possible, you're going to learn so much and that teaches you adversity and adversity is required when you're trying to build a startup from the ground up. Yeah. I've often thought about failure as it's a chance for you to prove that you've got the grit to keep pushing through you know, a little bit further. I want to ask one more question around that, which is your story of founding that second company, having this slow failure, and then realizing it and having that all hit you at once and processing that. And I just really related. I've experienced many failures in my life, but I mean, one super vividly that felt similar, felt like it was slow motion. And that realization all at once took a long time to process and a long time to sort out. And so I guess the question I'd be curious is, if you could go back to that moment in time in your life, and let's say you could whisper in your ear as you were going through those moments and laying in bed and just really struggling, what would you say to try to, I guess, remind yourself that this isn't the end? What would you say to maybe reframe that? It's tough when you've set this expectation for yourself. And I found that a lot of frustrations in life tend to be the disconnect between expectations you set versus reality. And so I set this huge bar of like, we're going to build a billion dollar company. We're going to be super successful. These are all vanity things. At the end of the day, I'm human. I still have an ego. I'm imperfect. But I still had these, like my ego was kicking in and my ego was kicking in pretty hard and set this really high bar from an expectation standpoint. And then when we were so far off from that, that was what caused the depression. That's what caused the like 
not leaving my bed for weeks at a time. It's like whiplash. Totally. Absolutely. And so I think it's important with whatever you do in life. And I've learned this being in a relationship with my wife and just professional relationships and just things that I want for myself that if you don't manage your expectations and if you keep your expectations static, you will be very disappointed. You will experience a lot of pain and anxiety and frustration. And so I've had to learn to make expectations fluid and not keep it static. And I've had to learn to evaluate expectations along the way. And so I should have tempered my expectations about the company, my second company from day one. And so it was a very humbling experience to experience that failure, but it kind of put me in a more appropriate mindset to go into superhuman where I didn't have these crazy expectations. I wasn't like, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. I did have ambition. So I think it's important to discern the difference between expectations and ambition. I was like, I would like for us to get there. That would be great, but I'm not expecting us to get there. And we'll just kind of see where this takes us. So that's what I would kind of whisper to myself, especially during the early days and through the painful experience of shutting down the company, is just constantly remind myself to evaluate my expectations and maybe refactor or recalibrate expectations. And it might be hard-coded, a weekly thing, a monthly thing, whatever it may be, but just making that an intentional exercise. I love your answer. That's something I've been spending a lot of time thinking about and have come to similar conclusions. And I think the way you described it of being fluid, being in the moment, which is you know another way of being present and not being fixed and allowing those expectations to be fluid is, I think, fantastic advice. This has been an incredible interview and you have so much to share. For anyone that wants to follow you, find you online, uh, wants to find Superhuman, obviously, I guess we talked about it, superhuman.com. <laughs> but where can people find follow you? Yeah, yeah. I'm on Twitter at V-S-O-D-E-R-A. Feel free to DM me. My DMs are open. My email is Vivek at superhuman.com. We can expect a five-minute response. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. Not these days. I am nowhere near Inbox Zero. I know that we get a lot of our customers to Inbox Zero, but I'm still a bit away from there. But feel free to reach out to me there, and I'm happy to follow up and be helpful any way I can. Thank you so much, Vivek. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 46, including links to everything we discussed, as well as a collection of five books, articles, and videos you can explore to learn more about being a co-founder. For more from Vivek, listen to the short bonus interview that follows this one, where I dive into everything from Vivek's habits to the tools he loves, his favorite books, and more, all in less than 20 minutes. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or leave a short review on Apple Podcasts to help others find the show. And finally, visit outlieracademy.com to explore more incredible interviews with guests like Scott Belsky, Kevin Kelly, and the founders of companies like Titan, Rally, and Primal Kitchen. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you right here next week on Outlier Academy.